is mighty to say he is mighty to save forever author of salvation heroes and conquer the grave Jesus conquered be no forgiveness without your blood. There would be no salvation without your sacrifice. Sing it again.
Good morning. It's so good to see you this morning. Would you stand as we worship together? John chapter 17 and verse 3 said, says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. James 4 8 also says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. God wants us to draw close to him this morning. He wants us to focus our hearts and our minds on him. And I hope that all of us can do that this morning with everything that's going on in our world. Let's come together this morning. Let's focus our hearts and let's draw our hearts to the Lord. One voice in the dark. A song that lights up the stars One breath that gives life One sovereign in power Who speaks with thunder and fire One Lord, one King There is no other that can compare to you you are the one alone in greatness, the one who never changes. Jesus, you are the one who rose in power, the one who reigns forever. Jesus, the one true God. Thank you. Y'all may be seated. Well, I can't tell you what a joy it is this morning to step into these baptismal waters. And I'm excited today uh, to be able uh, to baptize Aiden Curtis. Aiden's got two older siblings. 
um, Andrew and Abby. And they have, uh, he's got a younger brother, Anderson. So I guess you could say Mark and Casey made all A's when it comes to their four children. Aiden, I'm so excited about what God's doing in your life. Um, Aiden came to my office, and he and his dad, and he gave just a clear, powerful testimony of how Jesus has saved his heart and his life, and uh, it was no doubt in my mind that to be here today is is no question uh, part of God's plan. Aiden, we love you, and I know God's got big plans, and he's got a purpose for your life. You know, the Bible tells us as a church to go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So baptism is a picture of our dying to sin and the new life that we find in the Lord Jesus. And it's also a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So Aiden, tell us how old you are. You're 10 years old, and what grade are you in? Fourth. Fourth grade. And have you come to the place in your life where you've trusted in Christ and Christ alone to take away your sin? And who would you confess that Jesus is in your heart today? Amen. We're so excited about that confession, Aiden. It's upon your confession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior that I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism and rising to walk in a new way of life. Aiden, you have a church family that loves you, and thank you for sharing the good news of the gospel with your testimony of baptism. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, we rejoice in who you are. God, we thank you that you truly are the one true God. There is no other name given among men by which we can enter into salvation but the wonderful name of Jesus. God, thank you for the Curtis home for a home that chooses to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. God, I pray that our children would rise up like arrows in the hands of a mighty warrior. They would go out into this world to do mighty things for the kingdom of God. Lord, I thank you for the the privilege to be called a child of God. And Lord, as we gather together this morning for worship, Father, I pray that your name would be lifted up. Father, that your name would be blessed, and that, Father, you would draw men, women, boys, and girls unto yourself. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. i 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, 
outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I tell you about these things in advance, as I told you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, we must also follow the Spirit.
Amen. Thank you, Elise. Thank you for those that led us in worship this morning. Welcome. It's good to see you. Glad that you're here. And I know we have an online crew that uh, we also want to say welcome and an overflow group this morning. We had a good crowd at 830. So praise the Lord that uh, God is good. Amen. And I pray that we can lay it all down at the foot of the cross. Let me invite invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. At verse 21 this morning, I'm beginning a new message series that will last about four weeks called Spreading the Gospel Truth. And this morning, we're going to look at the subject of shining and scattering, shining and scattering. You know, Jesus teaches us in his word the importance of staying true to the right things. One question I've been asked over and over again over the past few months, especially in the recent days, is this question. Preacher, what are we going to do? Well, I think Jesus gives us the answer to that question. Not just here, but in other places in His Word. I want to ask you to stand in honor of God's Word this morning. We're going we're to read it as I preach through the text, but I do want us to pray over the reading of His Word and the the sermon this morning and ask God to just enlighten our hearts to the things that he would have us draw close to. Let's pray together. Father, today we come to you and we're grateful for the privilege. We're We're grateful for the opportunity to bow before you. And Lord, I pray this morning for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. God, I ask that you would go before us. Lord, I pray that you would give us receptive hearts. God, when the invitation is given, may we, may we be obedient to your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And you may be seated. I think about William Carey. William Carey is known as the father of modern-day missions. He spent seven years in India before he ever saw the first Indian come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. And yet he would say in the midst of it all that the future is as bright as the promise of God. Boy, I think we could say that this morning as well. Amen? The future is as bright as the promise of God. He would also say this. William Carey would say, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Adoniram Judson was also a missionary known as the father of American Baptist missions. He also spent seven years in a place called Burma, where for seven years he never saw one person converted and come to salvation in Christ. While he was there, he buried two wives, a number of children. He would die disappointed for his labors in the gospel, yet he was faithful to the end. Adoniram Judson would say that in spite of sorrow and loss and pain, our course should be onward still. We sow on Burma's barren plain, but we reap on Zion's hill. Amen? Listen, whatever's on your heart this morning, whatever's on your mind, Maybe you're the one asking the question, preacher, what are we going to do? I want you to see three things that Jesus gives us in this chapter four, where there's four parables. We're not going to go through the first parable. We're going to focus on the latter three. And so he says the first one, number one, we're going to shine the light. We're going to shine the light. Why did Jesus come to earth? Mark 10, 45 gives us that answer. Jesus came, the Bible says, to seek and save the lost. He used parables often. He tells us in verse 33 and 34 the purpose of parables. They're to take worldly stories that we can apply and and understand, and, and he gives us this story so that we can understand an even greater heavenly spiritual meaning to it. He used oil lamps here in these verses because a lamp, a light, was something that 
was familiar to the people. Matter of fact, it would be one of the artifacts that archaeologists, uh, archaeologists find more than any other artifact would be that of an oil lamp, very common in those days. And the Bible says, starting in verse 21, also he said to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And then he said to them, take heed to what you hear, and with the same measure that you use, it will be measured to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. The lamp or the light refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 12, that Jesus is the light of the world. In John chapter 1 and verse 4, the Bible says the one who is the true light of men is Jesus. And in John chapter 1 at verse 9, the Bible says the one who is the true light gives light to every man coming into the world. And so to take this light and to misuse it It makes absolutely no sense, does it? To have a light in the darkness, but yet just to hide it under a bed or to not put it up where it shines to the rest who see it. You see, you should take a lamp and you should put it high. You should put it high and out in the open. Jesus is the light. And God has sent this lamp to bring light into a dark world so that this light could enlighten the world to the truth and would push back the darkness. I want us to think about light and darkness for just a moment. According to that verse I just read in John chapter 1 at verse 9, Jesus is the one who gives light to every man coming into the world. You see, there is a sense of a general revelation where God reveals himself, and the Bible says, to every man that enters into the world. Let's just think about it for a second. If God created the world, then God turns the lights on for all men to see. You see, life is special. Amen? Life is special. Every life, from the moment of conception, in that very moment, life is absolutely special special. Life is the miracle from the almighty hand of God. When I think about life, I see the baby here. I don't think that was an accident. God just said amen, and he sent the little one into the room. Praise his name. Sometimes life enters into this world under some terrible circumstances. It does happen. But you know, our God is in the business of taking our terrible circumstances and turning what some would see as defeat and turning it into triumph because that's who he is. Every life is special to the hand of Almighty God. There are many in this world who just simply do not understand that the very air that we breathe is a gift from God's hand. See, his general revelation is revealed to every man that enters into the world. But I want you to understand, there there is also something called a special revelation. Whereas God reveals this to all men, there are some who reject it and there are some who receive it. There are some who will see how amazing and how wonderful and how awesome this God is and and recognize what he has done for them by sending his son into the world. And when he enters into their heart and they begin a relationship, it transforms everything about them when he reveals himself in this special way to his special people. You see, many live in this world. The light is revealed to them, but they don't recognize it. For those who have been transformed by the good news of the gospel, 
He transforms everything, and we are his children. We are his sons, and we are his daughters. And you see, we have this light that is living in us that the world on the outside just does not have. I want you to think about darkness for a moment. When darkness or the expanse of darkness increases, what has to happen for darkness to increase? Just think about it for a moment. Like, you ever been in a super dark room? How much darker can dark get? I mean, dark is dark, right? So, so how does darkness increase? Well, darkness doesn't increase in and of itself. Darkness increases when the light goes away. As the, as the light is removed, the darkness begins to grow and increase. But the opposite is true of light. When you put light into a dark room, what happens to the darkness? The darkness is dispelled. The darkness begins to run. The darkness begins to flee when the light comes. And so the more light that comes, the more darkness that flees. And right now in our world today, there is a tendency, if we're not careful, There is a tendency to look around. There's a tendency to see the darkness and to just get down, to see the darkness and to get discouraged. And trust me, I want to tell you this morning, I get it. I really do. But when the light is hidden, the darkness just increases. And verse 22 reminds us that there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. Verse 22 is a reminder to us that there is nothing that can come against us that is not going to be revealed in the light. And we must trust in that. You say, well, you know, it looks like sometimes when you look on the outside that the wicked is winning or that the wicked are prospering. But the reality is that our God says there's coming a day when he's going to make all things right. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ assures it. The second coming of Jesus that will occur establishes it. You and I need to shine the light of Jesus. I love verse 23. The Bible says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. In this chapter alone, in verse 3, in verse 9, in verse 13, in verse 23, and in verse 33, you hear Jesus saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, he's asking this question, are you listening to me? Are you listening this morning, church, that we are to shine the light. And in verse 24, it says, Then he said, Take heed to what you hear. With the same measure that you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. In other words, you respond to God's truth. And the more you respond to God's truth, the more truth that will follow. Embrace the kingdom in the here and the now and watch how God takes it and spreads it to the rest of the world. This is an important principle. Let me give it to you this way. We understand about exercising and eating right, correct? Everybody understands. Like it's a pretty pretty simple thing. If you work out and you exercise and you eat right, you're going to become healthier and healthier and healthier. And the very moment that you decide you're not going to eat, you're not going to eat right. None of us decide not to eat, do we? You're not going to eat right. You're not going to work out. You're not going to do those things. What begins to happen? You, you become less healthy and less healthy and less healthy. So, so the, the principle is the more you work out, the more you discipline your body, the more you eat, the healthier you become. I mean, I didn't get this slim, trim, athletic body just standing around. For those of you that don't understand, that was obviously a joke. (laughs) That's That's the point. The more light you shine, the more truth that comes, and the more the darkness runs. So the darker the day, the more we need to shine. And what Jesus is telling the church is to shine, shine, shine. Listen, we rejoice this morning. Hear me today. 
We rejoice not because the stock market is up or down. We rejoice this morning because Jesus Christ is king. Because Jesus came out of the tomb. Because Jesus ascended into heaven. That's why we rejoice this morning. Hear me, church. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I believe the church ought to be the happiest people and the happiest place on the face of the planet no matter what. You see, our joy doesn't come because we have these personal freedoms that we possess in the United States of America. And I want to say, as I dive into that for just a second, how grateful I am for the men and women who serve in our armed forces. This coming up week, we celebrate Veterans Day, and we ought to, and we respect that, and all that's great. And the Bible says there's no greater love than to lay down your life for your fellow friend and brother. And so when we think about that sacrifice, we rejoice in that. But we don't this morning have joy because of the freedoms that we possess in the United States of America. We this morning have joy because Jesus Christ is king. And Jesus has conquered for us our greatest enemy. And our greatest enemy is death and hell and the grave. And Jesus went to Calvary's cross. It was on a hill called Golgotha. When on the old rugged cross, the blood of our Savior ran down that cross and that blood paid in full your sin debt and my sin debt. And today, when I think about my joy, my joy today is not dependent upon my outward circumstances, but my joy today is because my eternal destiny with the King of kings and with the Lord of lords has been sealed and it has been signed and it has been been delivered and this morning that's why we have joy we don't have joy because of these freedoms that we possess you see church we've been bought with the price we've been purchased by the precious blood of the lord jesus christ and this morning if you're saved your name has been written in the lamb's book of life and there is absolutely nothing that can pluck your name out of that book And this means that we stand no matter what on the truth that we find in his word, the truth that we find in this book, and we trust in his promises that he has given to his people. And we go out and we shine, shine, shine. We shine the light to a dark world. And the more we shine, the more the darkness flees. So church, what are we going to do? We're going to shine the light. Somebody after the first service came up and they said, you are really shining this morning. I got it after a while. (laughs) I said, thank you. And then they just laughed and walked off and then I got it. (laughs) Second thing we need to do, scatter the seed. Scatter the seed. What are we going to do? We scatter the seed. Look at what the Bible says in verse 26. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and seed should sprout and grow and he himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and after the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle Because the harvest has come. This is the second time in chapter 4 that we read about scattering seeds. The first one was on the parable of the soils. This parable of the soils has the main focus is on the condition of the heart, the condition of the soil. Here, the focus is on the seed, the Word of God. You see, the Word of God is powerful. The Word of God is has the internal ability to do a work that we just can't simply see. This this particular parable, there's 39 parables in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this one is the only one that you find here that's in the book of Mark alone. You let the word loose and you watch the word work. You let it loose and you watch it work. 
You scatter the seed as far and wide as you can. You see, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 55 that the Word of God does not return void. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 that the Word of God is living. The Word of God is powerful. And the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. You see, when we scatter the seed, we're scattering seed that is alive and not dead. It is powerful. We must understand today the sovereignty of God, to trust in Him. And we must understand today the power of His Word. And those two things, the sovereignty of God and the power of His Word, they work together in authority and unity. So what do we do? We scatter the seed as far and wide as we possibly can. You see, what's interesting in this parable is the Bible says the kingdom of God is as if a man. They did, that he doesn't even name the man. I think that's important because the focus is not important of who does the scattering. The, what's, what's, what's important is that the scattering is done, that the word of God goes out. You see, the word of God is the seed, the seed that is scattered far and wide, and there is something that occurs, and the Bible says here that we're to go out and we're to scatter that seed and look at verse 27. And then we sleep by night and rise by day. And the seed sprouts and grows. He himself does not know how. In other words, there's a process that occurs that we can't see. Just this past week, I had a young man come into my office. I hadn't seen him in a long time. But in my early years of ministry, we spent a lot of time together. I'd helped him in different ways and even taken him to a couple of kind of rehabilitation places. Just invested a lot of time into this young man. and He had, was a difficult situation growing up. And he came into my office. I hadn't, didn't know what happened to him. I knew that there had been a path that he had taken that wasn't fruitful at all. And he said, man, I just, I just, I've been thinking about coming by to see you. I just wanted to tell you something. He said, there's something you said. And he told me something I said over 20 years ago. He said, I was sitting in a church service two years ago. I remembered what you said. I heard the preacher preaching. He said, and it was like God said to me and was speaking directly to my heart, you need to get up out of your seat and come down and ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and to be your Savior. And he said, I just want to tell you, I hadn't forgot what you told me. Listen, when you make an investment in someone's life and you share the gospel, you may walk away and you may say to yourself, man, they didn't listen at all. But I want to tell you, the Bible promises the word of God does not return void. And there is power in that word and that word is alive and you're planting seeds and you know what? We're not even important. We're not even named in the story. It's just a man, a man planting a seed, and then God does an incredible work. You know, think about a farmer. What does a farmer do? A farmer goes out, and he knows if I plant in the right type of soil, if I put it at the right time, if the conditions become just right, he, I can step away, and he not only understands that there's a miracle that occurs when that germination process begins, but he understands there's a certainty to that process, that it will occur if all of those conditions are met. Do you understand this morning the same thing's true with us? There's not only a miracle that occurs that we can't see, there's a certainty to, to the gospel that says the gospel will not return void. Are we scattering seeds today? In James chapter 1, verse 21, the Bible says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness. Hear this word, the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. What a great, great word. You see, God planted his kingdom through a Galilean peasant woman 
and a homeless man who was a carpenter from Nazareth and surrounded them with a bunch of nobodies who then turned into 12 who's taken the gospel to the world. You see, William Carey and Adoniram Judson, they may have thought that the work that they were doing and the words that they were sharing were just falling on deaf ears. Maybe even that evil was winning. But you see, even today, 300 years later, God's using the fruit, God's using the seed that they planted to share the gospel around the world. You never know how God's going to use our impact in this life. So what are we going to do? We're going to shine the light. What are we going to do? We're going to scatter the seed. And rest assured, the third thing, what are we going to do? We're going to reap a harvest. The Bible makes that promise. Look down in verse 30. Then he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? This is a question Jesus asked. What do we liken the kingdom of God to? Or with what parable shall we picture it? For Jesus says, you know, what is the kingdom of God like? What's a parable that we can use to picture the kingdom of God? And then he answers his own question. He didn't wait for a response. He just answered it. He said in verse 31, it's like a mustard seed. which when it's sown on the ground is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs, and it shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. Jesus draws upon the fact that something so small is going to become something so great. The tiniest seed in Palestine, and Jesus said the tiniest seed on the face of the earth, the tiniest seed in just a short time becomes a, a, a tree that grows to 10 to 12 feet with large branches and huge leaves where the birds come and nest under. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus said to the people, he said, because of your unbelief, For assuredly, I say to you that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. This morning, do you have that kind of faith? You say, preacher, my faith is really small. Jesus said all it takes is the faith of a mustard seed to put at the, at the cross, at the foot of the cross of Almighty God. And he takes what little we have. And if we'll just trust him with what little we have, he takes what little we have and then he grows it to something that only he can do. That's a good word this morning. What are we going to do? Listen, we're going to shine the light. We're going to scatter the seed. We're going to reap a harvest. Revelation chapter 7, the Bible says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, were standing before the throne and before the Lamb of God. They were clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and they were crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and when my sheep hear my voice, they follow me. Here's the question. The general revelation of God is revealed to all men. And the special revelation of God comes 
when we recognize his awesomeness and his greatness and the sinfulness of man and we turn from our sin, put our trust in the Lord Jesus, and the light of Jesus comes to shine in us. So we go out and we shine, shine, shine. Remember, the only way to dispel darkness is to let the light shine brighter. Let's pray together. Father, I pray this morning that we would draw close to you. Your word reminds us when we draw close to you that you draw close to us. So, God, I pray today that if there's someone here that's never received into their life the true light of the world, the Lord Jesus, that today they would take a step, they would come forward and say, I'm trusting Jesus to be my Lord and to be my Savior. Lord, help us not to trust in politics. Help us not to trust in any man. Help us not to trust in anything like a a government or a capital or any state house, any white house, any of those things. But God, help us to trust in you and you alone. And Father, we're grateful this morning as the children of God that your word reminds us that we are more than conquerors to those who are in Christ Jesus. That Lord, the What would it profit us if we gain the whole world and we lose our own soul? So, Lord, would your Holy Spirit just move today? And, God, I pray that your people this morning would be receptive to your word and they would follow you. They would hear your voice and they would follow your voice and they would take a step to the Savior. And, God, we praise you that we don't have to clean our life up before we come to the cross. We just come to the cross. We come needy. We come desperate. We come broken so that we could be mended by the King of kings and Lord of lords. And God, we recognize that over 2,000 years ago on a hill called Calvary, redemption came into the world through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the old rugged cross. And Father, I pray today that we would trust in you and you alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Would you stand, please? Our altar's open this morning. I'm here at the front. If there's a decision that you need to make, would you be obedient to the Lord? You come today just as you are. We're going to sing another verse. You come if God leads. Don't delay. Don't deny Him today. You come. You just lay it at the foot of the cross and let Jesus do the rest.
Jesus said, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near unto you. I come. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Well, we have a celebration this morning. I love these celebrations. And where's Aiden? I'm telling you, this is what happens as people share the good news of the gospel through things like baptism and testimonies. It becomes the light begins to shine and the darkness begins to go. That's what, ha- that's what the building of the kingdom of God looks like. And guess what? The faith of children teach us what that looks like. I just put chill bumps down me. That's awesome. Millie, come up here. This is Millie Manning and Ray, who serves as our youth pastor, and Melanie also as our youth pastor's wife. Um, matter of fact, we love Ray and Melanie, don't we? We love what God is doing through their ministry here. Yeah, let's, let's give the Lord a hand for that. Now, not only do they lead their ministry well here, but this is a picture that they're leading their home well and leading their children to Jesus, which is of utmost importance. And so Mason and Ezra, where where are y'all? Are they here? They had to go pee. Oh, okay. (laughs) We won't go there, but I get it. Uh, Understand. Millie, we're, we're excited for you. Millie came and she has given a clear testimony that Jesus Christ has come into her heart to be her Lord and to be her Savior. And so she's going to follow as well in believer's baptism. And if you rejoice with Millie's decision to follow Jesus and uh, accept her into our church by baptism, would you let it be known by saying amen? Amen. 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 And because we're just not shaking hands and coming by and all that stuff, you can do this. So everybody wave. This is everybody telling you how happy they are for you. Hey, guys, y'all come on in. I would ask you where you've been, but we already know the answer. (laughs) Let me mention a couple things. Tonight is a business meeting at 530, and immediately when I said that, you said, I'm not going to business meeting. We're going to talk about our church and all the great things. I love talking about our church and what God's doing and the many ministries that God's uh, using. And so you're going to probably hear some things tonight about our church that you probably didn't know. So I invite you to come back at 530. There is a, a 2021 budget that's in, on the, in back on the, uh, on, the, on the table in the foyer. There's also deacon nominations. We ask for you to fill those out. You can either fill out a deacon nomination, drop it in the box, or send it to Sheila Kelch, who's our ministry assistant here. She can tabulate those also, and you can make deacon nominations that way. And if you don't mind, I've, I've put into the bulletin and newsletter a little, a little uh, note about the deacon ministry. You know, since March, um, things have been a lot different in churches, how we meet and how we lead and all of the, how we interact with people. So it's definitely, it's definitely been different. But I really appreciate this group of men. We have 15 men that serve as our deacons. They serve on three-year terms. And even in the midst of all of this, uh, they've done a tremendous job praying for our church, leading us, supporting as we have made some decisions along the way. And so you pray about God, who God would have served the next three-year term um, as, as a deacon here at Auburn Baptist Church. I was also told to mention Operation Christmas Child Boxes are due next week, so I want to encourage you in that. I don't think I left anything out. Do you? Nope. All right, once again, y'all wave to Millie. Wave back, wave back. Say thank you. <laughs> We're excited for you. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. All right, amen. Praise the Lord. Jeffrey Mann, do you mind closing us in a word of prayer, please? Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.